Thank you. Thank you. So I was in this big leadership conference the other day. I was waiting for a colleague of mine to deliver a speech. The man's a genius. He's a top researcher, excellent. He's like a superstar in academia. So we were all excited to see him talk. He gets on stage, starts talking, and he was awful. It was a painful experience. You know, he was trying his best. We were trying our best to stay with him, but it just didn't stick. And we've all been there, right? In that business presentation, in that university presentation, in that communication where the speaker was trying and you were trying and nothing sticked. And we ended up losing our attention so bad that we ended up not remembering entire parts of the communication. So we're going to spend the next 15 minutes or so to answer a single question. May I have your attention? But before doing so, we'll have to go through some basic psychology regarding attention. So I have been standing in front of you for about a minute or so now. Has any of you noticed if I'm wearing anything of my hands? Anything? Bracelet, wedding ring, watch, what color, which hand? Take a couple of seconds to think about that, and voila. I'm wearing a silver watch on my right hand. But not many of you noticed that. Let me explain to you exactly how, you at how your attention worked. So your attention worked as a spotlight, like a flashlight. You, you focused all of your resources, most of your resources, on my facial region, because it's the primary source of communication while other aspects of my communication remain at the dark. And that's the exact definition of attention. It is the allocation of resources and processing towards one aspect of the environment, which means they're withdrawn from other aspects of the environment. But in order to completely understand attention, we'll have to play a game. Are you up for it? OK. It's actually a psychological experiment, but it's really fun and fairly easy. All you have to do. It's count. Can you count? Yeah. OK, I'll show you a picture of an open fridge. And all you have to do is count the items that are packed on the two doors. Not every item, only, I only the items that are packed on the two doors of that fridge. OK, but you have to do that in only 15 seconds. I'll do the counting. OK, go. One, two, three. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, fourteen, fifteen. Stop. By a show of hands, how many of you got above thirty items? Wow, did not see that coming. And how many of you got exactly 33 items? Which is a correct answer, by the way. <laughs> OK, how many of you are in a position to tell me the exact number of bottles on that fridge? Interesting, right? I mean, you had your flashlight on, yeah? You had it on, your light. They, you were counting items. But you weren't absorbing all the information for you from this environment, right? Why? Because I dictated that aspect of your attention. So it's not what is out there you perceive. You perceive what you pay attention to. And I have another question for you. Has anything changed on my appearance? <laughs> yes. <laughs> the, <laughs> the watch, no, I'm not a magician. The watch flew all the way from here to here in front of your eyes while you are doing something else. Right? And how many of you listen to me skipping numbers while counting? OK, not everyone. <laughs> but, but most of you people were selectively blind and selectively deaf to my aspects of communication because you were doing something else. OK? So if you imagine that this is my content, and this is other people's brain. This is what happens when you don't get attention. Nothing will stick. 
attention is the glue that will stick your content into other people, people's brain. So if you can control other people's attention, strategically control other people's attention, every communication event, every interaction, you can make it useful, but within organizational setting, within work environments, you can make it valuable. Attention is a super tool when it comes to communication. So today I'm going to share with you my six basic principles that can use to make anyone, to attract anyone's attention, okay? Principle number one, minimize distraction. We many times do that mistake. Um, we, we are so eager in communicating our ideas that we forget one thing. We forget one thing. If they don't pay attention, they won't listen, right? So I was, in, um, I was trying to teach physical education to first graders a couple of years ago. So I was like, okay, here you go. Stick your feet on the ground, take your ball and throw it up in the air, and then get it back. I'm talking to six-year-olds, okay? Pick it up in the air and pick it back. When suddenly a white pigeon come and lands in the middle of the field. You know what happened? Oh my God, Mr. Wolf, what a beautiful pigeon. Oh, that's what <laughs> nobody was watching me. They were all about that pigeon. I could change my watch. I could dress up as a clown. <laughs> they wouldn't even notice that. No one will notice that. Like you guys, when you were counting items and you didn't see flying watches, you know? They wouldn't pay attention. And we many times do that mistake. We want to say finish that sentence, but they're not listening. We need to scare away the pigeon first. And the pigeon is an analogy of every distraction we ever had in our communication environment. Keep it simple. Our brains love simplicity. We know that from research. But we many times do another mistake. We, in, our, in our attempt to sound sophisticated, well-educated, smart, we use all these fancy words and mm, complicated meanings. We shouldn't really be doing that. I will give you two examples, two sentences, and you would choose which one do you prefer best, okay? Sentence number one, same meaning. We need to balance between theory and practice. Sentence number two, the practical technocrat and the Theravamon dark intellectual comprise forms that are outdated at the same level that do not only not facilitate, but actually inhibit the birth of a new humanitarian type of human. <laughs> right? <laughs> Keep it simple. Our brains love that. Unlock your body by a show of hands. How many of you have you ever been in a um, family dinner lately or coffee with friends, partying? Yeah, exactly. A lot of partying here. Uh, so, if, if you could see yourself, if you could see yourself being all natural and three-dimensional three and communicating, you know, oh my God, she was wearing her high heels, holding two glasses, and, and she tripped, and oh, it was all over her, and you were natural, energetic, confident, you're being you. And then the other day, you go to have your business presentation or your university presentation, and you go, follow my name is Savas Trijas, and today I'm going to review 568 pages about communication. May I have your attention? No, you may not have our attention, because your fear of public speaking has sucked away any natural ability you ever have. Let your body do the speaking, right? Don't bore their brains out. Another thing we know from research, from brain studies, we only have eight to 10 minute window spans of attention. In other words, we got lazy brains. Okay, so if I'm talking to you now, if I'm lecturing, if I'm monologuing, you are hardwired to lose your attention in eight to 10 minutes. But we have a solution about that. Just change the format of information. Add some humor. Add some visuals, video, say a story, make an activity, keep them on their toes. Don't bore their brains out. But I did mention stories, didn't I? Stories are an excellent tool for engaging attention. Stories can make us see. Stories can make us feel. Stories can make us use our, uh, use our 
inner senses. There is actual data that demonstrates that when we are ex exposed to successful storytelling, there is this neurochemical called oxytocin, oxytocin, which is released in our blood. In other words, uh, uh, oxytocin, sorry, is responsible for feelings of kindness and cooperation, okay? In other words, when you hear a good story, we lean forward and we are more acceptable to the message we receive. My son won't even eat his dinner if I don't tell him a story. We love story. We love story. But what's the point of telling you about the effectiveness of storytelling if I don't say a story myself, right? I'm going to demonstrate my sixth and final point using a story. Be aware of attention alarm. So, I was with my son Christos the other day, and we were about to do our speech therapy exercises. You know, we, ha we have some trouble uh, pronouncing the letter R, uh, so we're going to speech therapy to fix that. So, okay, I was with my son, and we were like, okay, Christos, I, I have to see your tongue. Dr Perfect, until the third minute. Christos, I, I saw him, he was reaching his tiny pocket and he, I, he was holding something. And I, I thought, Christos, what you got there, son? He took it out and it was his tiny, irritating, yellow Pokemon stuff. You know that, the, <laughs> the, the point. And I said, Christos, we're only here for three minutes. We have so many exercises to do. What are you doing, son? And I was offended. I was offended, really. Because three minutes, that's all I get? After two days I get, I go, yeah, I got this. This time will be different. Christos, train, train. Let me see. Train. I didn't change anything in my strategy. Can you guess what happened? In three minutes, three minutes time, Christos, not only did he took a Pokemon action figure, he has his body now, and he was battling all along, and I was all like, don't hear. I was frustrated again, but then it hit me because Christos was giving me a lesson at that time. He was letting me know the exact time I lost his attention because Christos is only five years old. I was the grown-up. I was in charge of the attention handling, and I didn't do anything to gain it. And then I thought, man, I talk to people all the time, large groups, small groups, even one-on-one. -on -one. Would it be great if any group I ever had hold, was holding the tiny Pokemon in his pocket, and whenever I lose attention, they would go like this? <laughs> Please don't go like this in my presentation. I would get very offended. But imagine that. Now, oh, what do people hold? 50 Pokemon. Really sorry, you guys. That was my fault. And then go back and regroup and come back to gain your attention. Otherwise, I'm talking to blind and deaf people, right? Selectively blind and selectively deaf people. And then I thought, I took it a step further. Are there any such mechanisms? I mean, I know you don't have any Pokemon on you. I, I hope you don't have any Pokemon on you. <laughs> But are there any such mechanisms that can help me do that, get that kind of feedback? Yes, they are. It's all these times when you will reach your smartphone and start scrolling Facebook while I'm talking. It's all these times when you were looking at your watch and trying to hide your, <laughs> your yawn. And my personal favorite, you know, the, I call it the empty look or the zombie look. It's that look when you go like, you're watching at the speaker, but you're like, <laughs> and, and you're laser beaming through him, and you're traveling through your supermarket list, or which high heels should I match with what dress, you know? Anywhere else beside that room with me. And what do I do? What do I do when I detect this alarm? I go back to my six steps. Do I have anything distracting in my speech? Can I scare away a pigeon first and then regroup? And the pigeon is an analogy. We said that. Am I being too complicated? Am I boring your brains out? Can I insert the story, some humor, an activity, something to keep you on your toes? Remember the original equation. 
we had a brain. I told you about the glue. So the next time you will find yourself, yourself in any situation that you will have to communicate your ideas with someone, remember the magic ingredients that would help, that would make your content stick to other people's brains. Attention. Thank you very much.